Hello and welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. We welcome you to the sunny south coast of England. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you can see, the church is empty at the moment. It's one of the great tragedies that this glorious building that God has blessed us with is empty and unused. But hallelujah, the church is not the building. This is a wonderful resource and we hope and pray that you will be able to join us soon in the coming months when we finally get over this pandemic. We hope and pray that we will all join together as the body of Christ and sing the praises of God again, one in unity and spirit. But thanks to God, through the technology of the internet, through the technology of YouTube and, and recordings and everything else, God is not bound. The Holy Spirit is not bound. The people of God are not bound. We are one in Christ. And so will you join me as we worship Jesus together? Hear now the call of God to worship. And don't just think of these as the words of David in Psalm 30, but think of them as the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially as we are celebrating the victory of Easter. Last week, we remembered that Jesus rose again from the dead. And this week, this week, we are continuing to grow in the triumph that came through that. And so hear the words of Jesus in Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, You brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And so it's with this glorious hope, this expectation in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of all the problems that we face, that we turn to Jesus, the mighty victor. We turn to him in triumph and we raise our voices to him in song as we sing Love Divine, All Loves Excel.
sadnesses that we have as a church is that we can no longer meet around the Lord's table while the COVID-19 pandemic continues, as we continue to be locked down in quarantine, we can't meet around this glorious table. For me as a pastor, there's nothing more sad than seeing these little cup holders empty. And these simple plates where we offer up the Lord's bread, where we celebrate our unity, that we who are many are one loaf. It's empty. For those of us that love taking this simple ceremony, as we come and we take these elements, as we partake of this glorious sacrament, what an amazing thing it is that we can have unity with Christ. And that's been taken away from us. But the longing to be with Jesus hasn't been taken away from us. I've spoken to several people in the church and several people have suggested, well, is it possible for us to celebrate the Lord's table in our own places, in our own homes, in our own living rooms, with our friends and our loved ones, with our family? Now, that's far from ideal. It's far from what the Lord would have for us. The Lord wants us as a church to meet together, to become the one body of Christ, to be his embassy, his people, his glorious body here on earth part of what we do as the lord's people is celebrate the lord's table to demonstrate our unity and our dependence on one another but the longing to be with jesus that intimacy that we experience around the lord's table hasn't been taken away from us and it's important for some of you, this may be awkward. For some of you, you may not want to participate in this. But for others of you, this is exactly what you want. And so I'm going to make a suggestion. I'm going to leave it between you and the Lord, between your conscience and uh, your Lord. But I'm going to suggest that next week, during the week when you go out to do your shopping or when you receive it, that you place an extra order and you get a little bit of bread, a little bit of wine or grape juice, and in the privacy of your own living room, with your loved ones, or if you're by yourself, just with you and the Lord there, that we try, by the power of God, to have a sense of unity as we come round this table. I'll be in this empty building next week. I'll have some bread and I'll have some wine. And I will just follow through the words of institution that we find in 1 Corinthians 11, I'll read those, I'll pray, I'll explain what we're doing, and I hope and pray that you will take the bread and the wine that you have in your living room, and even though we may not be able to do that at precisely the same moment, if we seek to do it on the Lord's Day next Sunday, as we seek to do it together, bearing in mind our longing to be with one another, our God is not bound. He's not bound by space or time. He's not bound by anything. He knows why we have to be apart at the moment. He understands. And he's a gracious God and he longs to meet with his people. And so if you have that longing to meet with the Lord Jesus around his table, I think we have to do it in a virtual way. Far from ideal, but our God wants to meet with his people. And so let me remind you again, make sure that you order in some bread or some wine or some grape juice Bring those things together and next week we'll come round this table again and these racks won't be empty. This cup, uh, that we will have a cup. There won't be an empty plate. There will be bread. And together, by the Spirit, we will have unity with our Saviour. But until then, we need to be continuing in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you because we need you. We come to you, dear Lord, because we have no one else we can turn to. We come to you, dear Lord, because you are our only hope, our only joy. Lord, we've been reminded of our separation from one another in so many different ways. We long to have fellowship with you, with one another, but we can't and we need you. Lord, some of us are struggling. Some of us are struggling with loneliness, anxiety, 
Some of us are all by ourselves and we feel that the world has forgotten us and we need you, Lord Jesus. We need you. Oh, bless us, help us and strengthen us. Give us encouragement day by day. As we open the word of God, as we pray to you, dear Lord, please speak to us so that we can receive that comfort that we need from you. Others of us, dear Lord, are worried about our friends and our loved ones and our families. Some of us, dear Lord, are worried about our children. About Some of us have adult children and we worry about the bad mistakes that they've made, about the betrayal and hurt that they've received uh, from others. Dear Lord, please bless and strengthen them. Give them peace of mind, dear Lord. Show them that love, that peace of God that passes all understanding. Show them, dear Lord, the strength that they need to make good decisions. Bring them peace and comfort. Others of us are struggling because we have been betrayed and hurt by loved ones. People have walked out on us, have told lies, have hurt us in deep, deep ways. Bless and strengthen us, dear Lord, to cope. We pray, dear Lord, for our widows. We pray, dear Lord, that you would wrap them round with your love, that you would reassure them of your amazing love for them bless and strengthen them dear lord give them your peace we pray for our government we pray for the swift healing and recovery of boris johnson our prime minister we pray dear lord that he would come back to full health soon and that he would be able to make good decisions pray for the chief medical officer, we pray for the cabinet, we pray that they would make good decisions that would uh, weigh up all of the needs of this country. Lord, we pray that you would stay the hand of this pandemic. We thank you for the National Health Service, we thank you for the doctors. I pray for my doctor friend uh, up, in, um, up in Cumbria. Lord, please bring him healing. Have mercy on him and help him to recover from this um, uh, coronavirus that he's received lord please bring him healing and protect his wife and his child as well use his gifts and his skills so that he can swiftly return lord i pray for my um, doctor friend over in illinois as well lord please bless and protect russell have mercy on him help him not to spread the infection to others uh, help him not to catch it himself protect his family as well dear lord I pray that he would be, um, have great wisdom as he ministers to other people in the midst of this pandemic. Bless and help him, dear Lord, and all of the other doctors and nurses just like him. Pray for those who are in, nurse, uh, are, who are in nursing homes and uh, retirement homes. Dear Lord, please protect and bless them. Have mercy on them. We want to pray for those individuals in the congregation who have businesses or who have lost business or who are self-employed lord please continue to provide for them show them your grace and your mercy please help them to overcome help them to pay their bills help them to uh, to make the best of what they have have mercy on them and bless them dear lord oh father god we pray that you would bless these videos you would bless our phone calls that you would bless our encouragements to one another, that you would use all of these things to extend your kingdom. Make us strong, dear Lord. Help us to triumph in Christ in the midst of this adversity that we are going through. Bless us, help us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to sing, Lord, I will delight in thee. It's a wonderful song. It always fills me with joy when I hear this. It's an, uh, another song by my friend Luke Morton. Uh, what a wonderful blessing that we can delight in Jesus. And if we're not delighting in Jesus, then what basis do we have to overcome and to triumph in the midst of all the adversity that this life sends us? <laughs> Light in thee and on thy care depend to thee in every 
trouble flee my best my only friend when all created streams are dry thy fullness is the same may i with this be satisfied and glory in thy name Can be found, but may be found in Thee. I must have all things and abound while God is God to me. He that has made my hips secure with a gear all good provide. While oh, Christ is rich, can I be poor? What can I want beside? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oh Lord, help thou my unbelief and still my every fear that I may know thy sweet relief and feel thy presence near oh lord i cast my care on thee i triumph and adore henceforth my great concern shall be to love and please thee thousand years ago, the small city-state of Rome started to grow. First, they managed to conquer the Italian peninsula, and then as they had military success after military success, they eventually surrounded the whole of the Mediterranean basin and even came across to the British Isles. And all of this was won by war and bloodshed. It was based on slavery. It was based on theft but it worked. If you were an ambitious Roman senator, if you wanted to grow in your prestige and wealth as an aristocrat, if you were part of the equestrian class and you wanted to expand your power and prestige, you would go into the, uh, into the army and there you would rise up through the ranks till eventually you gained enough prestige and respect and enough influence to be able to gather an army round, and then you would go to the edge of the Roman Empire and you would find new tribes to conquer. The painting you're looking at at the moment is of Julius Caesar, sat in great authority, having just conquered one of the Gaulish tribes. Gaul is in modern-day France. One of the Gaulish tribal leaders is throwing down his weapons at the feet of Caesar in submission to him. Down to this side, you can see kneeling there is another one of the chieftains. He too has surrendered to Caesar. News will get back to Rome about this great victory. And in Rome, the Roman Senate will gather together. And they'll decide, is this victory worthy of a triumph? And if they vote that it's worthy of a triumph on the appointed day, Julius Caesar would bring his troops into Rome. All of the streets would be lined with people. The whole of Rome would come out to see the conquest, the fruits of this theft and pillage. First, the troops themselves would go through the streets of Rome. 
phalanx after phalanx, cohort after cohort, century after century would, be able, would work their way through the streets of Rome as the people cheered them on. Smoke and incense would rise up. The, sm the smell would fill the streets. Eventually, in the middle, would come Caesar himself, magnificent on a chariot, looking glorious. Behind him would be all of the slaves that he had brought into captivity. Many of those would be sold in the slave markets to work on the surrounding estates and farms. Many would work in the quarries. Others were there as a sign of submission to the authority of Rome. And there, at the end, would be the conquered kings and chieftains. And they met the grimmest fate of all. These rebels against Rome would be brought into the centre of Rome in front of the temple of Jupiter. And there they would be slaughtered to show all of the other rebellious kings that dared resist Rome about what would happen to them if they stood up against the mighty Roman Empire. It was a grim and grisly time. And the astonishing thing is, this is the image that Paul uses to describe our lives as Christians. Here now, the word of God. Our God and Father, we pray that you would bless us and help us to understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, Paul writes, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death and to the other the fragrance of life. And who's equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. This is the word of God to us today. I want us to think today about how it is that Christ leads us in triumph. I want us to think about three things. Christ leads us to overcome suffering. Christ leads us to overcome misunderstanding. And Christ leads us to overcome compromise. But I want us to start by thinking how Christ leads us to overcome suffering. It doesn't sound obvious. But when Paul writes, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance and knowledge of him. This beautiful painting is probably the way that we'd like to think that the Christian life ought to be. There's Christ up in heaven interceding for us. There's the Holy Spirit, the dove uh, coming down from heaven to give us the power and strength. And there's us, the little babe in Christ. Uh, being carried by angels triumphantly through life so that we can go through that archway into heaven. And what an easy and wonderful thing it is as we sing the praises of God throughout our life, as we rejoice in all of the good things that God gives us in life. And I wish the Christian life was that simple. I genuinely do. It's the most wonderful thing. There's so much to rejoice at in this life. The singing of God's praises, the gathering together of God's people, the mutual love and encouragement that we give to one another. All of these things give us joy and blessing. It is a glorious thing. But the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, this painting carries a much, much deeper message than you'd imagine. Just think about that phrase, who always leads us in triumphal procession. I want to give you a quote. Here's a scholar, Moyer Hubbard. He says, while some translations of verse 14 give the impression that Paul is portraying himself as one of the victors, marching in a triumphal procession, this rendering is linguistically impossible. If we're to fill out the NIV translation in the light of the triumphal imagery, and in accordance with the attested meaning of this Greek construction, 
we would render this clause, thanks be to God, who leads us as conquered foes in triumphal procession. That's quite a different image. What we'd love to believe is that we are in Christ's triumphal uh, procession as his victorious army leading it. When in reality, the original Greek of this uh, verse tells us that actually we're the conquered slaves at the back. And that is a source of comfort and strength to Paul. Just think about what we've read so far about all of the struggles and misunderstandings that he's been having at the church in Corinth. He's going through misery and heartache and uh, difficulty. And yet, in the midst of all of that, he says, no, I was a rebel against God and Jesus came and conquered me and now he's brought me into his empire and I now serve him. I was once a victim of a tyrant, cruel king who kept me in misery and poverty, the devil himself, and yet Jesus has conquered the devil and has brought me into his empire to serve him and his purposes. And have a look at the painting again. This is the Triumph of the Christ Child by Ambrosius Franken. It's painted over 400 years ago. But have a look. Firstly, you've got as details within the painting. You've got the temple guard's lanterns. Remember how the temple guard came down to the Garden of Gethsemane with lanterns? And then there's the pillar of flagellation. That pillar isn't accidental. It's not uh, a part of a building. It's a reminder that Jesus was tied to a pillar and beaten. There's the cross itself, of course. There's the notice that Pontius Pilate put up there saying, King of the Jews, this is what he was being executed for. There's the sponge of gall and vinegar. There was the ladder used to remove Christ's body. And all of that comes before the victory of the resurrection. All of that comes before the fountain of living waters that you see through that archway that symbolizes the glories of heaven to come. And so the Christ child it's been empowered by the Holy Spirit and carried by angels to face all of these things. And you and I, dear brothers and sisters, are children of God. And yes, angels may carry us through the difficulties and struggles of this life, but we are to walk in the way of Christ. I came across another quote. Here's Carl Truman as he writes about Martin Luther. I thought this was really helpful. As Carl Truman writes about how Martin Luther, the great reformer, was trying to help the, the new Christians who had left behind the misunderstandings of the Roman Catholic Church at the time and had wanted them to come back to the authority of the Bible. He wanted them to understand that the Christian life was one of following Christ. And so... As Carl Truman sums up Luther's theology of suffering, he says, the theology of the cross isn't simply an example of how God is gracious. It's also the basic pattern of understanding of how he is to work in us and through us, his church. The theology of the cross isn't a cerebral thing. It's not just one we think about and grow in understanding in our mind. It profoundly affects our Christian experience and existence, making demands upon our whole lives and turning theology into something which controls not only our thoughts, but the very way in which we experience the world around and taste the blessings and fellowship of God himself. Suffering and weakness are not just the way in which Christ triumphs and conquers. They are the way in which we are to triumph and conquer too. In other words... If suffering and weakness are the ways God works in Christ, it is to be expected that those are the ways that he will work in us who seek to follow Christ. One does not become a theologian by knowing a lot about God. One becomes a theologian by suffering the torments and feeling the weakness which union with Christ must inevitably bring in its wake. 
Those are strong words, but they're true words. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. And so as we think about that painting, that painting accurately shows us that yes, we're a child of God. Yes, Jesus intercedes for us. Yes, Jesus sends down the Holy Spirit to empower us and bless us. Yes, we are empowered and blessed by angels. But we still follow the way of the cross, a way of struggle, a way of suffering, a way of hardship. But we bear all of that willingly, knowing that Christ himself suffered those things. And knowing that if, even if we don't fully understand why is God taking me through such a hard time, why am I so worried about my loved ones? Why is this so difficult and hard? We look at our cross and then we take our eyes off our cross and we place them again on the cross of Jesus. And we say, Lord Jesus, I would far, far rather serve in your empire. I would far rather serve under your kingdom. I would far rather serve you with this cross than be under the slavery of misery and meaninglessness and hopelessness that I once was before you con conquered me. My conquest is now a liberation. My slavery is now a freedom as I serve you, as I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm a slave to you, and by being a slave to you, I am free, free to do what you designed me to do, and free to love you and serve you forever. And so, yes, yeah, we may go through hard times in this life. Just that painting reminded us through that archway. It's the conquest of the grave. Beyond the conquest of the grave is the fountain of living waters, the fountain of life that Jesus at the end of Revelation says, come and drink from the waters of life. Come and drink freely. All the glories that are to come, if only we will follow Jesus. And so, pick up your cross day by day. Remember that you are part of that triumphal procession. Jesus has won the victory. He has rescued you. He has brought you into his kingdom. And he has a greater kingdom to come. The second thing I want us to think about is how Christ leads us to overcome misunderstanding. Paul says, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. There are two images wrapped up here. One image is of the aroma of all of the incense and everything else that is offered up as part of that triumphal procession in Rome. And the other image is the image of the temple. The temple of Solomon where on the altar of incense, that incense represented the prayers of the saints. And both the prayers of the saints and the altar of incense in the temple in Jerusalem were a pleasing aroma to God, something that brought delight to his heart. It's a wonderful thing to go out into the garden and to smell, to smell the roses, to smell the different flowers. It's even better, obviously, if you don't have hay fever, but oh, what a wonderful thing it is to smell the delicious perfume of honeysuckle on a summer's evening. It's the most glorious thing. And of course, smells have this amazing power to awaken our senses and to bring back memories. In fact, many religions use different types of smells. If you go to the Far East, you'll find Chinese temples and Hindu temples where they offer up incense. If you were to go into ancient Jerusalem, you would find there the high priest would be offering up incense. If you go to Orthodox churches and Roman Catholic churches today, there on high days and holy days, they offer up incense to God. For us as Bible-believing Christians, for us first and foremost, it is the prayers of the saints which the, is the incense that we offer up to God. 
But whatever it is, it's what the incense is pointing us towards, which is something that rises up and brings pleasure to God. And so we live the Christian life. We live the Christian life in faithful obedience to Jesus. We live it in a way that we want to tell others about the goodness of Jesus. Oh, come and find out how good God is. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me tell you about what Jesus has done in my heart and my life. Experience it for yourself. And those of us that know Jesus and have found that strength in our own hearts and our own lives, we're delighted to tell everybody else. But we also have a new way of living as well. We say, no, I can't live that way. I can't support those things. I can't be behind this. No, those things are bad because they are displeasing to my God. I want to live this way. I know that this is the way that we are designed to live. And of course, the more we yield ourselves to his authority in our life and the more we turn away from those bad things and bad influences in our lives, the greater joy we have in our lives, the more that everything seems to make sense. So that is part of this pleasing aroma to God. It's our lives lived as a sacrifice to him, but to other people. Exactly the same thing. Our reaction to God and all those good things are a stench. I love this photograph. Here's two photographs. Here is the uh, incense rising up, the smoke rising up, just as ordinary grey smoke. Nothing special to look at, but the smell is wonderful. Here's a second uh, photograph. Here the photographer has used a green light to illuminate the smoke. The smoke hasn't changed at all. It's exactly the same color. It's exactly the same smell. It's, it comes from exactly the same source. But with the, this light projected onto the smoke, the smoke looks completely different. And that's how people are with our Christian lives. We live as God enables us and as God forgives us for the many sins that we do commit. As we seek to live to please God, we live in a way that is different from the world. And as we do so, we're a constant reminder uh, to the world of their own failures and of their own guilt. And so they look at us, and as we say, no, sex outside marriage is uh, sinful. No, honesty is always the better way. Yes, we need to be people of integrity and truthfulness. Yes, we need to be oath, bearers, oath keepers. We need to have uh, integrity in all that we do. As we seek to see those things, not just in our own lives, but more and more reflected in our culture around us. And as we uh, react against the evil that we see around us, people start to resent us because they're caught up in all of that. And we know it in our own hearts. We see the temptations. We struggle there. And in some respects, we may be, even be a, a little bit of a hypocrite because we can't live up to those standards that Christ has set to us. But we come humbly to Christ again and again, seeking forgiveness, and we say, no, your way is better. And people hate us for it. And so it wouldn't surprise me if you've got a child or a friend or a neighbor or a colleague at work and they think that you're a fool for being a Christian. But maybe one of the reasons why your friend thinks that you're a fool for being a Christian, or maybe you're watching this and you're not a Christian yet yourself and you're thinking, you fool, how dare you, you hypocrite. Maybe the problem is with you. Maybe the problem with the gospel is the gospel's ability to shine light on your own sinfulness and selfishness. That's what happens. The light of God's word comes down into the darkness of our heart and suddenly we feel bad because we're not the good people that we imagined we were. We thought that we could boast and say, I'm good enough for God. My good deeds have outweighed my bad deeds and I'm better than other people, so I'm all right with God. And suddenly the light of God's word shines into the darkness of our hearts and all is exposed and some people say, oh Lord Jesus, forgive me. And other people say, oh Lord Jesus, I hate you because you make me feel bad about myself. And that's the divisive power of the gospel. And every time the gospel is preached in truth and in integrity, that's what happens. It's always divisive. It divides light from dark. It divides night from day. So that's the way the Bible starts and that's the way the Bible ends. 
And so, dear friend, are you that pleasing aroma to God or are you looking at us as Christians and thinking, oh, what a horrible stench? Are you projecting that green light, that envy, that greed, that bitterness from your own heart onto Christ, onto what the word of God teaches? Or are you willing to put that light out, that green, bitter, poisonous light? Are you willing to put that aside and say, Lord Jesus, show me you, show me yourself, show me your word, show me your way of living on your terms? Are you willing to let Jesus conquer you? Are you willing to join his kingdom? Are you willing to join his triumphal procession? Are you willing to pick up your cross and follow him? So finally, Christ leads us in triumph by helping us to overcome compromise. Paul says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Peddlers have been found throughout the world and through all of history, and it's a very simple thing. If you own a shop, if you haven't got property, but you can afford to buy a few things, maybe sell some water at the side of the road, maybe just use some basic skills that you have to help other people. In Paul's day, it was quite common for uh, the Greeks uh, 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 an intelligent young man where he would go off and go to the academy and he would be taught by the philosophers and he would try and make a name for himself and then he would work his way around the villages and he would say I've got these astonishing insights that will help you to live a victorious life or help you to understand why the world is it and if you just pay me uh, I will tell you this good stuff that I need to know and then I'll move on and basically they were just selling the Greek philosophy that they picked up and they when people had learnt those things they would move on to the next village and then the next village and then the next village and that's what people started accusing Paul of doing he was just in it for the money he was going around and he was taking up this collection and it wasn't really going to go to help the poor people back in Jerusalem. No, he was taking up this money and he was stuffing it into his own pockets and he was becoming wealthy. And the only reason he would constantly wanted to go on and plant new churches was so that he could rob them as well. One of the great tragedies of the church today is that there are Christians, Christian leaders out there that are like that. They go out and they have one ambition and one ambition only, which is to take other people's money. And they say, this is the victorious life. If you want to have this victory, if you want to have this health and wealth, if you want to be as good looking and powerful and uh, influential as I am, just have the faith that I have, but send me $500 and then you too will be able to have this. It's sad. And many, many people believe it. But Paul says, no, we reject that. In fact, we just with sincerity say what God tells us to say. And so one of the reasons that I have had to talk about the theology of the cross, that picking up the cross, that difficulty, rather than saying, let's triumph in God, let's sing his praises, let's just pretend everything's hunky-dory and happy and woohoo. I know that there's Christian ministries that just always, only ever concentrate on the positive. And there are many, many things to be positive about. But if we only ever do that, then we're just peddling the word of God. But if we speak with sincerity, we say the hard truths that the Bible also teaches. And so we point people to Jesus. Jesus reigning triumphant in heaven. Jesus having overcome death. Jesus coming again to make all things new, to make a new heavens and a new earth where, where there will be no more death and pain and suffering. Jesus giving us hope after death. We preach all of those glorious things, but we also preach Jesus crucified. Jesus betrayed by his friends. Jesus nailed to a cross. Jesus beaten. And betrayed. And we remember our own sufferings, bound up in Christ's sufferings. Him giving us the strength to overcome them. Him reminding us of his mere 33 years of life on this earth as a human being. 
and for almost 2,000 years now, that body, that body that was so cruelly treated, risen again victorious, ascended into heaven 40 days after the resurrection, seated now at the right hand of God the Father, coming again in glory at the end of the age, the Lord Jesus Christ having overcome. How short those 33 years seem to be in comparison to the almost 2,000 years since he ascended into heaven. And how short this life will be for you and I. Whether it's 80, 90, 100 years that we live, how long eternity will be in comparison. And so we preach the word of God in sincerity. We try and tell others in sincerity the good news of Jesus. But also we encourage people to sit down and count the cost. We remember that Jesus called us to pick up our cross and follow him. We remember that this life is short and that heaven is long. And with sincerity we say, find mercy in Jesus. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we come to you now. We just ask that you would bless us and help us. We ask, dear Lord, that you would help us to overcome. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you sent Jesus. He, the great general, invaded our territory, conquered our slave master, the devil, put him to death, and has now brought us into his kingdom. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, for the freedom that we have in Jesus. Now help us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Help us to be that glorious aroma, that wonderful incense. Hear our prayers, dear Lord. Bless us, strengthen us, and help us. And help us, dear Lord, to act in sincerity, to tell others the good news of Jesus. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. We're going to conclude our worship by singing, May the mind of Christ my Saviour. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. I hope and pray that this was a blessing to you. If it was, please share it with your friends and your family, email it to other people, share it on Facebook, whatever it is, let other people know the triumph that is ours in Jesus Christ. And until next week, God bless you.